Today, we are coming together to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and this is one of the great privileges that we share as believers. The Lord's Supper has been designed by God to to help impress the gospel deep down into and to nourish our souls. What I'd like to do today before we take communion together is to take some time and, and share with you just exactly what the Lord's Supper is. What exactly is happening as we come together to share the Lord's Supper as a church family? So, to help us do that, we want to direct our attention to the Word of our God. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to be looking at verses 23 through 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. Here we read, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray now and ask for the Lord's help. Father, we give you thanks. Lord, now as we turn to your word, Lord, we come to your table, and and, and before we come, Lord, we, we turn to your word. And Lord, it is you we want to hear speak to us today. So, Father, I pray that you would bless me to faithfully unpack the things that are here. And, Lord, I pray that your word would come and it would nourish our souls. And, Father, that you would build up your church. Do great things, I pray, here in this place. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray and say, Amen. Well, there are are three things I want to do this morning. I want to look at, number one, the nature of the supper, then number two, the nature of the sacrifice, and then number three, the nature of our salvation, okay? The nature of the supper, the nature of the sacrifice, and the nature of our salvation. So, number one, the nature of the supper, I especially want to help us understand what we're doing here today because because what we're doing is very different from what our Catholic friends do when they celebrate the Eucharist as a part of their Mass. The Eucharist is the Catholic version of the Lord's Supper. And as I said before, and I I want to reiterate this, while I critique the Catholic view of the Lord's Supper, I want to do it with respect and with charity. And and, uh, hear me, this is the reason I want to do this. You know, on the one hand, as a pastor, I don't think it would be healthy for me not to correct unbiblical views of important things. Like, I don't think that's helpful. But also, I also don't think it's helpful for us to be uncharitable like when we, when we stand for the distinctions that we hold. Here, this is my view of truth. Do you hold this view? I believe that every ounce of biblical truth that I possess is due to one thing, and that is the grace of our God. So, what should that lead me to do when I see someone else who does not believe the truth? I don't believe truth because I'm better or smarter than other people. There are plenty of men and women more intelligent than me, better people, better fathers, better pastors who may disagree with me on sometimes important things. But what that leads us to do is be gracious in the way that we stand for the truth. Our Lord Jesus, and this is we, we planted the church largely based on this principle. When the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. He was full of grace and truth. We've we, we got to have both, all right? 
So, you know, the, the other thing I'll just say is that the things I'm going to say this morning, like, I feel like, I feel like I'm 100% right on the things I'm about to say. I wouldn't be saying them if I didn't. But, you know, I'm also pretty sure that one day I'm going to stand before the throne of God and I'm going to find out that my theology wasn't perfect. Right? So, I want, you know, that should lead us to be charitable. Right? All right. So what is the nature of the Lord's Supper? All right. Catholicism teaches that in the Lord's Supper, there is a re-presentation of Jesus' sacrifice to the Father for the forgiveness of the sins of those who partake in the Mass. Catholics hold to a teaching which is called transubstantiation. That's a big word, but break trans, transform, and substance, Right? They, they believe that the substance of the bread and wine are transformed miraculously into the actual body and blood of Jesus. And when they say that, they don't mean that it turns into a piece of flesh and a piece of like, you couldn't test the DNA in its blood. It's not the form, but it's the substance. It's the essence. So when the priest lifts up the cup and they pronounce you know, what they pronounce over it, they believe a miracle takes place and these elements, body, soul, blood, uh, let's see, body and blood and soul and divinity are there in the elements. This is what they, what they teach. So, and, and this is the thing, when the priest lifts up the cup, he believes he is in the place of Christ, re-offering the body and blood of Christ again to the Father to atone for sins. I have several problems with that. But first, we do have to deal with the fact of some things that Jesus said because there are some things that Jesus said that we need to have some pause and take. And look, right? Jesus did say, remember? He said, take, eat, this is my body. He, he took the wine, take, eat, this, this wine and this cup is the new covenant of my blood. So Jesus said some things there, and, and people, if you take that wooden, with wooden literalism, you have to say, hmm, all right? But let me give you some of the reasons. Let me give you three reasons I don't believe Jesus intended us to believe that at communion, the bread and the wine become the literal, actual embodiment or the substance of the the body and blood of Jesus. Number one is an argument from silence. Well, an argument from silence, you really, can't, you really can't prove anything by an argument from silence, but it, it can be very helpful. So the argument from silence goes like this. Jesus nor any of the apostles, none of the biblical authors ever taught that the bread and the wine miraculously transform into the the body and blood of Jesus. That's never taught in the scriptures. It's only assumed and, and later taught by, much later by, by councils and, and popes and, and much later. But the second reason is, and really think about this, y'all. Let's think about the Lord's Supper. Here's Jesus holding the bread and the wine in his hands. When he says, this is my body, was he intending for the, the apostles there that night to, to think in their minds that Jesus intended to say that what I am holding, here I am in my physical presence, but really this is my body and my blood. Is that what Jesus was intending? I don't think so. Uh, second reason, in Luke 22, when Jesus said, this is my body, which is given for you, he also said, do this in remembrance of me. It's a reminder, right? He's saying, I want you to do, this is not a re-offering. This, this is a reminder. It's a reminder because it is symbolic. The third reason that I don't believe there's any warrant to believe in transubstantiation that the 
bread and the wine are miraculously transformed into the actual substance of Jesus' body and blood, is do you remember how the Lord's Supper got started? If you know, say. What, what is the Old Testament feast? What's the Old Testament ceremony that Jesus took and converted into the Lord's Supper? Passover. Right, the Passover Supper. Do you remember what the Passover was? The Passover ceremony, a, a yearly ceremony instituted by the Lord, it was, a, it was a memorial service to remind the children of Israel of the salvation that God wrought when through Moses God delivered the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage, right? So the Passover meal uh, contains several elements. Um, there's, there's an egg, there's bitter herbs, uh, there's um, a shank bone of a lamb, there's wine, there's unleavened bread. And here, from these elements, each one of those, each one of the things that made, over, made, made up the Passover supper were symbolic in some way of God's deliverance of the people out of Egypt, right? So he takes a, a, a ceremony which is symbolic in nature and he creates in it for the new covenant, right? A ceremony, a ritual, which is symbolic. The bread representing his body, the, the, the wine representing his blood. Not only did Jesus say that the Lord's Supper would be something, not only did he give it to the church as an ordinance, which, would, which, which he said was to be practiced as a memorial, a reminder of his sacrifice. The whole, the whole ceremony is based on an Old Testament ceremony which was symbolic in nature. So let's look at number two. That, that's, that's the nature of the Lord's Supper the nature of the Lord's Supper, we say these elements are, they symbolically remind us of Christ's body that was broken for us and his blood that was shed for us, all right? And the victory that we have in his sacrifice. I want to look now at number two, the nature of the sacrifice. And when I use the word sacrifice, um, Catholics, when they lift up the cup, they would call that a sacrifice, that is a reoffering of the sacrifice once again. I am talking about the sacrifice that Jesus made once and for all upon the cross. Um, you could say that when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are offering up a sacrifice of worship. I mean, through obedience and faith, um, offering up our hearts, um, adoration to God, it's, it's, a, it's a sacrifice of worship. But we are not sacrificing anything here today. We are remembering the perfect sacrifice. So, in the Catholic Mass, in the Eucharist, there's a literal representation or offering of the body and, uh, and blood of Christ to the Father for sins that have committed. Now, I told you I want to be kind, but I also want to be honest. I believe this to be a gross contradiction of Scripture. I believe this to be to fundamentally contradict the gospel and desecrate the true offering of Christ. In Hebrews chapter 9 and 10, we see Jesus as the great high priest. Incidentally, the reason that we don't believe in priests or that there needs to be a pope who represents us to God on our behalf is because we believe Jesus' work as the great high priest was so thorough and so perfect and so complete that there is no longer a need for any other priest to represent men and women to God. In fact, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, there, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, his, y'all, 
When, when the moment he died, the veil of the temple was split in two. The, the veil was what kept only the great high priest could go behind there. But Jesus' work was so perfect that he, he literally took away the veil. And in our benediction, I'm going to read from Revelation 1 and 5, Jesus' work as our high priest was so thorough and perfect that it says, we have been made by his sacrifice, a kingdom of priests ourselves. Right? That's the doctrine of the priesthood of every believer. There's one priest, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 9 and 10 presents Jesus' sacrifice as a, as a once and for all act that forever, fully and finally dealt with the sins of the people of God. Now, what I want to do here for a few minutes, and I want you to turn with me. If you have your Bible, I want you to open with me to Hebrews chapter 9. I'm going to read a larger selection from he and I'll make a few comments here along the way, but I want you to see with your own eyes what I'm saying, right? This is why I say that the, the Catholic Eucharist is a gross contradiction of the gospel, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. For Christ has entered, right? This is Christ as our high priest. He has entered not into the holy places made with hands, right? Not the temple, not the tabernacle, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself. See, that's what the holy place, the holy of holies and the temple and the tabernacle represented. It represents the throne room of God, where God sits enthroned. This is where Christ has entered now with his own sacrifice. Now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Verse 25. Nor, listen to this, listen to the logic. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood, not his own, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all. And that in the Greek, it's once and for all, a point in time. Once and for all, at the end of, of the ages, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it... And he's talking about the ceremonial law, this, this repetition, this repetitious uh, offering of the sacrifices year by year of the Jewish people, the, the priests when they entered. It can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make, make, the, make perfect those who draw near. All right, this is chapter 10, verse 2. Otherwise, they would... They, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers having once been cleansed would no longer have any consciousness of sins? You see what he's, you see what he's doing? He's making the argument that, that a sacrifice that needs to be repeated over and over cannot save. It is not sufficient. This is what he's, this is what he's comparing and contrasting here. He's trying to show that Christ's sacrifice was so sufficient that it, it does not and it will not ever need to be repeated. Okay, this is verse 9. Okay, so chapter 10, verse 9. He added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He, Jesus, he does away with the first, the ceremonial law, in order to establish the second, the new covenant. Verse 10. And by that will, in other words, by the purpose of God, by God's intention in this, by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Verse 11, and every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifice which can never take away sins. But, but when Christ, had offered for all time a single 
sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. The nature of Christ's sacrifice is that it was so perfect, so complete, so powerful that it only ever needed to be offered once. If Hebrews 9 and 10 are true, which they are, then every time a priest stands and lifts the bread and the wine over his head. It is a desecration to the true sacrifice of Jesus. It is an insult to the offering that Jesus made in the true holy of holies. They are desecrating the true beauty and power of Christ's sacrifice. In coming to the Lord's table, we are not re-offering the body and blood of Christ to the Father. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six 26 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. I love the nature of the Lord's Supper. It, it's a ceremony uh, where we are, we're looking to the perfect work that Christ accomplished in the past, and we are proclaiming it until he comes in the future. The nature of the supper, the nature of the sacrifice. Now let's look at the nature of our salvation. So much of this really comes down to how we understand salvation. Is salvation something that we do, or is it something that God does? Is salvation something that we cooperate with God in? Like, is it a, do we partner with God in salvation? Like, he does some of it, and we do some of it? In Catholicism, the Eucharist, their version of the Lord's Supper, is one of seven sacraments. In the, in, in the Catholic Church, sacraments are things that you do in order to be saved. Included in the sacraments are baptism. They teach um, when a person's baptized, and they baptize their children when they're born. They believe that when you're baptized, that act brings you to new... That's regeneration for them, Right? You are made a child of God by the virtue of being baptized. Um, confirmation later on when you were confirmed in the church as a believer. Confession or penance, an act which you must do in order to be saved. To a, and again, confession, not just confessing your sins to God, but you confess to a priest, right? You must confess to a mediator who then is able, when when... when when a Catholic goes into the confessional booth, they confess their sins, and the priest will give them some penance to do, you know, say so many Hail Marys, or whatever it is, go and do this or that. Then they will pronounce that the person is absolved of their sins. All of this, really, if you think about it, is very appealing. Do you know why? Because if there are things that you and I can do to participate in and guarantee our salvation, then you and I have some measure of control. And every single one of us, to some degree or another, in some part of your life or another, we're all control freaks. Like, I don't know about you, but driving is it for me? I can't really stand to be in a car and not be the one driving, right? They'd be over there pumping the brakes for Carrie when she's driving, you know, or trying to tell her how to do it all because 
What is, what is that? You know, I want to be, we want to be in control. We don't want salvation to be by faith alone because we prefer to have a say in it and some control in it. Here's the problem with this view. The Bible clearly and repeatedly says over and over again that you and I are not saved by our works. We are not saved by anything that we do. We are saved by works. We're saved by the works of Christ. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. I love this. The evangelical churches in Ecuador, this is the verse they have on the front door of their church. This is what makes the distinguish. Catholicism is there. Like the vast majority of, of religion in Ecuador is Catholic. This is what the evangelical churches, the Protestant churches, have on over their front door this verse. For by grace, you want to know what it means to be saved by grace? For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Watch this. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. You see Paul's logic. If salvation is this participatory thing, God makes it possible, but you make it actual. You secure it by your works. You earn it. You do the things that... that and and uh, you look... You go on YouTube. Check me out. Um... Catholic theologians have no problem calling these things that they perform meritorious. In other words, the works that they do earn their favor, earn God's favor. It, if salvation is a result of some things that we do, Paul's saying, then we can share in the glory with God. It would be very helpful for us to read the book of Galatians. In Galatians, some false teachers had arisen within the church, and here's what, they were claiming that people were not saved by faith alone. They, they were saying, in order to be saved, you have to believe in Jesus, plus there are things you have to do. Things like circumcision, the, some of the ceremonies of the Old Testament law. So salvation was based on, yes, you did need to believe in Jesus, but you also need to do these works. It's a, very, it's a perfect parallel for Catholic theology. Paul comes in and he says in Galatians 2.16, he says, we, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be, to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. I want to show you, Paul, Paul goes deeper than that. Listen how serious this is. If you're thinking, well, I'm partially saved by faith, and I'm also partially saved because of the things I do. Listen to what Paul says. Galatians 5, verses 1 through 4. He says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You, you're trying to hold on to faith and works. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. That's how serious this is. You see, to say you're saved on the basis of faith plus anything else, is to fall away from Christ. It's to be severed from Christ. So when we come to the Lord's table, we're not coming as an act to earn God's favor. Or we're not coming because taking this is going to somehow um, bring us forgiveness 
of sins, we are coming as an act of worship. We are coming as an act of honor. We are, act, we are coming as a, in an act of faith and thanksgiving, an act of remembrance for the once and for all perfect sacrifice of Christ. Now, I don't, I don't, just, I don't, just, don't want to just pick on Catholics, because guess what? Evangelicals have our own version of this. Just because you don't call it sacraments, you don't believe the, you know, the theology that's so different. I, I mean, we, you could very easily do, I, I believe in Christ, plus I have joined the church. I believe in Christ, plus I tithe. I believe in Jesus, plus I do, I feed the poor. I believe in Jesus, plus anything. And, and, and listen, at the root of this, every single one of us, we, we have the same disease. The default mode of the human heart is for us to save ourselves through our own works, through our own effort. So even when you intellectually grasp the freedom of the gospel, there's constantly going to be this insecurity that we're always wrestling with. Have I, have I done my devotions good enough this week? Have I witnessed as much as I'm, you know, you, you contribute money to the kingdom of Jesus. Is it enough? Should it be? There's always, we're always going to be rever- in our hearts. Kind of like there's this place where, I think it was in Acts 7 in the Sermon of Stephen, where Stephen talked about how the children of Israel in their hearts turned back to Egypt. You know, in our hearts, there's going to be this, Remaining sin is going to constantly be tugging us back towards captivity, the captivity of salvation by works. It's going to be a constant fight. You know, in the Jewish tabernacle or the temple, do you know what there? You know what was absent? Chairs. There were no chairs in the Jewish tab- tabernacle or the temple, do you know why? Because the priest's job was never done. You get this picture of Jesus who has entered into heaven with his once and for all sacrifice, and what are we told? He is seated at the right hand of God. So perfect is his work. So perfect is his sacrifice. The difference between Catholic theology and what we believe is this. At the end of the day, in Catholicism, you know what you can never have? Assurance of your salvation. You might, in Catholicism, you could be baptized born again, you could be confirmed, you could have gone to confession a thousand times, you could have attended a thousand masses, and you come to the end of your life, you could commit a mortal sin and be lost forever from grace. But I have good news for you today, brothers and sisters. In biblical Christianity, even the person who has the, sm- the weakest the smallest amount of genuine faith in Christ and his perfect work can rest most assuredly that Christ knows his sheep and shall not ever lose even one. That's what we're coming to celebrate here today. I'm going to pray, and Mark's going to come up. We're going to sing another song before we enter into the Lord's Supper. Father, we really, there's no way we can even begin to know how to thank you for the perfect sacrifice. Lord, somehow, in your infinite wisdom, you sent your Son to become the ultimate, the true and better great high priest and the true and better sacrifice 
whose value was so infinite, so extraordinary, so powerful, that it only ever needed to be offered once. We thank you that our Savior has triumphed over sin and death and the grave and is seated high and lifted up at your right hand. It's Him we praise. And I pray that you would continue to receive the praises of our lips because of the virtue of our great high priest. In whose name we pray. Amen.